Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, I wanted to alert you to the fact that Cannonball Books has a new author, George MacDonald. Yesterday, we published George MacDonald's classic, The Princess and the Goblin, with a great introduction from Dr. Timothy Larson. From the introduction. Although The Princess and the Goblin is not an allegory, it is nevertheless a deeply Christian piece of writing. Throughout his entire life, George MacDonald was always trying to lead people to God, and it is clear that he hoped that this chief lesson of The Princess and the Goblin would be applied to the person most worthy of our trust and obedience, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Trust and obey Him. Get George MacDonald's The Princess and the Goblin from canonpress.com. So, welcome to the podcast. This is episode 141. Here we go. So, we've been talking a lot about COVID-19. We've been talking a lot about pandemics. We've been talking a lot about uh, various spin-off issues that uh, arise um, because of this sort of thing. And what I wanted to talk about today is I just wanted to briefly uh, talk about what a biblical quarantine is. In in biblical thinking, in biblical um uh, in the biblical world, there is such a thing as a corporate societal exercise of authority over someone who has done nothing wrong. In other words, they're, they're not a criminal, but we can isolate them. All right. So in Moses' Israel, if someone came down with leprosy, that person was declared unclean. The person who was unclean uh, the person who comes down with leprosy, who is unclean and contagious, okay, uh, is isolated. They're put outside the camp. So basically, you have a leper colony or a place where people who are contagious and therefore a threat to the rest of the body can be isolated for the sake of the larger society. Now, but what happened in this, um, in this recent pandemic is that people are so obsessed with identity politics, and there, there's the egalitarianism, which is a dogma that insists that everything's got to be the same. Egalitarianism has them so by the throat that if you have an outbreak, and what really was a serious outbreak of COVID-19 in New York City, if you have a serious outbreak in a place like that, fundamental fairness, so the argument goes, decrees that you have to treat everybody in South Dakota exactly the same way, okay? Uh, when the president shut down travel from Wuhan, which was the epicenter of the coronavirus in China, and then later cut, you know, closed down uh, travel from, from Europe, uh, people were talking about it in terms of fairness or discrimination. In other words, they want the world to conform to their pre-crafted ideology. Everybody's got to be the same. So consequently, we've got to treat them the same. And we've got to treat them the same regardless of how different everything is. The reason Smith goes out to the leper colony is because Smith is the one with leprosy. You don't send him out to the leper colony and you don't make uh, Jones shelter at home and make Murphy shelter at home and then say, well, fair is fair. Let's have Smith shelter at home too. You don't do that for the sake of an abstract notion of fairness. What you do is you, you plug the hole. You plug the hole in the boat where the hole is. You don't, um, you don't plug the hole where it would have been nice for you to have had the hole. You don't plug the hole where you've got a piece that would fit your imaginary hole. You have to plug the actual hole. So, I just wrote a piece this morning on the Idaho Code. Um, in the Idaho Code, basically, they, they define in the code isolation as the isolation of an infected person or a person who's likely to be infected. 
okay, an infected person or a person who's likely to be infected. So let's say that someone comes from uh, working in a Chinese hospital where there, there were hundreds of COVID cases, and they come back to the States, and let's say they're not presenting any symptoms. There's nothing irrational or unbiblical or unscriptural or unfair about making them self-isolate or putting them in quarantine for two weeks to make sure that they don't have it, because you've got warrant for believing that they might have it. If someone comes down with the symptoms or if someone tests positive for the disease, or if someone has recently been around a whole bunch of people who have the disease, it makes really good sense to isolate that person. And so the Idaho Code defines quarantine as uh, blocking the exits and entrances to a place where isolated persons are, and isolation is where is someone who's infected or likely to be infected. What we did, for the sake of this flattening the curve, was introduce a legal novelty into this situation where everybody, everybody was basically told to shut down, shelter in place, except for essential workers. If they had not, and you say essential to what, (laughs) then you say, you should say, essential by what standard? What do you mean essential? Worship is, worship is essential. Worshiping God is essential. Why, why is here in Moscow, Idaho, the whiskey store is open, the whiskey store is open, the golf course is open, and churches are closed. Now, is there a value, is there a value system embedded in that? So if you go to Winco, if you go to a big grocery store, you can have 200 people in there if you observe social distancing. So if we observe social distancing at church, can we have a church service? No. Now, what's happening here? What we've done is we've taken the biblical concept of quarantine and the biblical, the, the, uh, biblical allowance for it and turned it on its head. And the reason this matters is that if you can look at the Idaho Code, the, uh, Idaho's governor appealed to the Idaho Code for his authority doing what he did, and then you go look at the code, it says something completely different than what he did. And once you start being able to do that, then that means that your right to keep and bear arms means that you don't have the right to keep and bear arms. The right to free speech means that you don't have the right to free speech. The right to peaceably assemble means you don't have the right to peaceably assemble, and so on. Continuing on with uh, podcast 141, uh, hamartiology. Our word this time around is atomazo, atomazo. The word basically means dishonor and is formed in much the same way that our English word dishonor is formed. Honor is the root verb and dis is the prefix or negation. Honor and dishonor. In Greek, tomazo is related to the fact of honor, tomao, and a is the prefix of negation. So, a theist is someone who believes in God. An atheist is someone who does not believe in God. Okay? Gnosis is the word for knowledge. An agnostic is someone who claims to have no knowledge. So, atomazo is someone who negates the honor, dishonors. The word refers to more than simply the absence of honor. It is more active than that and refers to contempt. So, uh, in Luke 20, verse 11, And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully, there's our word, and entreated him shamefully, and sent him away empty. Jesus says, in answering the charge that he was demon-possessed, that this was a dishonor that contrasted with the honor that Jesus showed to his father. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. That's in John 8.49, Atomazo, you dishonor me. When the apostles were beaten for their preaching, they responded to this with joy. It was a grace to be disgraced. It was an honor to be dishonored. That's in Acts 5.41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame, Atomazo, for his name. This is also something that we can actually do to ourselves through our own sin. This is particularly true of homosexual sin. Romans 1.24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So, uh, what's involved in homosexual behavior, uh, one of the driving forces of it is self-loathing. The actor 
is acting upon his own body, and he acts upon his own body in a way, uh, in a way as to degrade it or dishonor it. We also see that to break the law is tantamount to dishonoring the God who graciously gave us his law. Romans 2.23, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? So God is the one who gave us his word, gave us his holy law, and if we break the law, then that is the same thing as showing contempt for the one who gave us the law. And James warns us about the sin of having contempt for the contemptible. It's a sin to have contempt for the contemptible, at least the contemptible of this sort. But ye have despised the poor, Atamanzo, but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? We flatter rich men, we fawn over them, we, we, we um, bow and scrape before them, but they're the ones who mistreat us. And there's a tendency to look down with contempt on the poor, Atamanzo. Uh, my book that I want to review this time around is by Gene Veith, Gene Edward Veith, and it, it's his latest book uh, called Post Christian. Post Christian. He's he's written a number of fine uh, books. He he wrote a book on postmodernism uh, a number of uh, years ago uh, called Postmodern Times. Uh, he's uh, written a number of books for the um, Christian Worldview series that I wrote for. Also, my Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning has um, his uh, reading between the lines and his postmodern times and uh, uh, the state of the arts. So uh, Veith has done a number of really good things. He's one of the finest cultural analysts, I, I think, writing today in English. I think he's just really good. And, and yet, when we try to think back 20 years ago, uh, and we're thinking about how fruity everything seemed then, it's quite striking when Gene Veith, in this book, Post-Christian, is surveying the lay of the land now, and we're seeing a lot of the things that he was addressing early on starting to come to fruition. Basically, the revolt against God, the revolt against God has sort of moved into its high-handed, <laughs> its, uh, high-handed phases, and, and we are now attempting to ascend the sides of the north. We, we want to create ourselves. We want to make our own value. We want to make our own being. We want to make our own reality. We want to be able to simply declare and have it be so. Gene Veith basically gives us an up-to-date survey of the secular landscape. What's going on? Uh, what's going on out there in the culture um, that the secularists are in the process of trying to uh, wreck and remake? What's what's actually going on there? What, the, there are a number of valuable things, number of valuable observations about this book. If anybody wants to be current on the culture wars has to be current on what's actually going on in the culture. So you, you, uh, one of the things a, a wise general does, um, a general wants intelligence. You, don't just, you don't, don't just write letters to the editor, and you don't just go to the state legislature and propose bills. You have to know who the thinkers are on the other side. You have to know what's, what's going on. What are they proposing? Where are they trying to go? What are they trying to get at? So people like Nancy Piercy and Jean Veith are very astute, very careful, very good observers of what's actually going down. Um, so I, I commend this book highly. One of the most valuable things I, I got from it was um, there was a, a, a gentleman, Hanan, uh, last name of Hanan, who was a contemporary of Kant's and was part of that set. He was a brilliant, brilliant uh, fellow. Um, and was initially part of the Enlightenment movement and would have been a big name, I think, had he stayed with it. But he was radically converted and became a Lutheran, radically converted while he was in London. He was, um, uh, well, you're, I'll say he was a, the same kind of German that Kant was. Uh, so border shift and, you know, he was from that neighborhood. And his uh, former friends were sort of dismayed at the at his conversion, but he, he was one of these 50 pound brains and, you know, sort of a brain with feet. And, but he, he reminds me a lot of Pascal. 
So, um, so Hanan basically answered the Enlightenment claims. So a lot of the a lot of the foolishness that we're dealing with today in the public square is traceable to mistakes that we made when we followed Kant. Um, and Hanan um, answered Kant back in the day. It was it was not like God waited uh, 150 years to have someone finally arise and answer Kant. Uh, the answer was right there on the spot. God provided it, and God provided it. And I'm really um, encouraged to, to see um, Vith, Vith is currently working on a project to, to bring more of uh, Hanan's writings back into print, back into circulation. And uh, there's a really wonderful section in this book about, uh, uh, about Hanan. So, I commend the book Post-Christian, Gene Vith. Buy three today. Thank mm-hmm. you.